Hi, let's talk about the major venous systems. In this video, I'll outline for you the major systemic veins. We'll discuss venipuncture and the significance of the median cubital vein. We'll talk about the great saphenous vein. And we'll also talk about the hepatic portal system. So the major veins of the superior mediastinum and thorax really are a, uh, a beautiful conduit of returning blood from the head and neck, upper limbs, and the thorax. So conceptually, it's important to understand that the superior medica vena cava is going to drain all of these areas, and it is supplied by the brachiocephalic veins. Also understand that the left brachiocephalic vein is longer and more oblique than the right brachiocephalic vein. And if we look on the cadaveric image here, we can see there's the superior vena cava. We have a very long and oblique left brachiocephalic vein crossing over the superior mediastinum there. These brachiocephalic veins are formed by the confluence of internal jugular veins with subclavian veins. So wherever the IJV that is returning blood from the head and neck meet with the subclavian veins that are returning blood from the upper limb, the thorax, and the head and neck, the brachiocephalic vein is formed. This area here where these veins come together is known as the venous angle. So there is a left and a right venous angle. And these venous angles are going to be important for lymphatics because it's within the vicinity of these venous angles that the lymphatic ducts are going to return lymph back into venous circulation. On the left side here, we'll have the thoracic duct. And on the right side, we'll have the right lymphatic duct. Now the, uh, the upper limbs are an interesting region uh, in terms of venous return. And I say that because the major veins of the upper limb are superficial veins. The minor veins to the upper limb are deep veins, and those deep veins are going to be veni comitantes, or accompanying veins, of their respectively named arteries. So for instance, there are veni comitantes of radial and ulnar arteries, of brachial arteries, etc. And so what we can see here uh, is that there is a very long cephalic vein running along the lateral aspect of the upper limb and a very long basilic vein traveling along the medial aspect of the upper limb. And there's tremendous amounts of variation here. And there is a sometimes present, or I should say a frequently present vein called the median cubital vein, which represents an anastomosis between the cephalic and basilic veins. The median cubital vein is an excellent site for vena puncture. So for uh, a person to take a blood sample, um, veins are frequently used for vena puncture because the blood within them is under less pressure, um, so there's less of a risk of blood spraying everywhere, um, and on the upper limb they're very easy to locate. Now the basilic vein is going to dive deep, and it is going to come together with the brachial veins, which are veni comitantes of the brachial artery, to form the axillary vein. That axillary vein will traverse the axilla 
and then it will become ultimately the subclavian vein which will return back to the brachiocephalic vein. The cephalic vein is going to dive deep here in this deltopectoral triangle where it's going to meet up with the axillary vein. Looking at the thorax, at least the posterior wall of the thorax, um, we can see a really interesting venous system called the azygous system or azygous system. That would mean not paired. As you can imagine with the proliferation of viscera in the thorax, things like the heart and lungs, there isn't a, a whole lot of room uh, nor is there an opportunity to access uh, easily the cable system. I mean, we'll have a very, very short, very short inferior vena cava. We have a very short superior vena cava. So that leaves all of this space between with no direct access to the cable system. So the solution that has evolved is this azygous system. On the right side of the thorax, so keep in mind that would be right and that would be left, we have a very large and long vein called the azygous vein. This azygous vein is going to drain the right intercostal spaces. Generally it's draining intercostal spaces three down through 11 plus the subcostal vein. So these all feed into the azygous vein. And the azygous vein is then draining into the superior vena cava. There are also potential connections from ascending lumbar veins, generally coming from at least the first two, but sometimes the first three lumbar veins that will drain into the azygous vein. On the right side, there are two vessels that are going to drain into the azygous vein. These are the accessory hemiazygous vein and the hemiazygous vein. The accessory hemiazygous vein typically is going to drain intercostal spaces five through eight. And these come together to form the accessory hemiazygous vein. I'm sorry. And then that crosses the midline and feeds into the azygous vein. The hemiazygous vein is from intercostal spaces nine through 10. And sometimes we'll also have subcostal and an ascending lumbar. And then this also is going to cross the midline and feed into the azygous. The, um, the higher intercostal spaces, so intercostal spaces one and two, these can feed into either the brachiocephalic veins or sometimes in the vicinity of the venous angle. There's a lot of variation there. There's a lot of variation throughout this azygous system. So if you were to look at uh, 10 different uh, anatomical donors, you might actually see 10 different variants here. It's just, this is the, the classical interpretation of the, uh, the azygous system. <clears throat> inferior to the diaphragm, we have the inferior vena cava. And so, here is the cross-section of the inferior vena cava. Uh, we have typically uh, visceral branches returning blood laterally, parietal branches returning blood posterior laterally, and sometimes we can even have the errant anterior branch as well for viscera. So let's take a look at the, uh, the branches of the inferior vena cava. Let's start down here. At the bottom, start at the very beginning. Very good place to start. The IVC 
is the coalescence of the common iliac veins. So these are draining the lower limbs and the pelvis, and they come together to form the inferior vena cava. We'll also have the fourth and the third lumbar veins draining into the IVC. We can see on the right side, we'll have the right gonadal vein draining into the IVC. On the left side, the left gonadal drains directly into the left renal vein. The renal veins are very likely going to be the largest visceral branches into the inferior vena cava. On the right side, we'll also have the right suprarenal vein and the right inferior phrenic vein feeding into the IVC. Whereas on the left side, the left inferior phrenic and the left suprarenal generally form a trunk that then feeds into the left renal vein. And so this can cause issues here if there is any impingement on the left renal vein because it bears a very close relationship to the superior mesenteric artery. And what happens if we look at this in profile, let's say this were the abdominal aorta, and there is the SMA, that renal vein, that left renal vein, sits in the crook between these two arteries. And if there's any sort of aneurysm from either of them, so uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, that would completely compress the left renal vein, halting the blood flow from the left gonadal vein, the left kidney, the left suprarenal gland, as well as the left side of the diaphragm. So this is known as left renal vein entrapment syndrome. And it's colloquially referred to as nutcracker syndrome because the SMA and aorta look like a nutcracker in with respect to the left renal vein. So this, this asymmetry here between the, uh, the right and the left renal vein is very, very interesting. In addition to all of these branches, there's also a cluster of generally three hepatic veins. These are hard to, to see because the liver is going to be in the way for a lot of the, uh, the dissections, but these hepatic veins are draining blood from the liver into the IVC. That blood in the liver gets there through two sources. One, the right and left branches of the hepatic artery proper, and two, the blood from the hepatic portal system. All of that blood gets returned to caval circulation through these hepatic veins, and there are generally three of them. Moving right along, Regarding the pelvis, that inferior vena cava receives right and left common iliac veins. Those common iliac veins are where the external and internal iliac veins coalesce. The internal iliac veins drain the pelvis, the perineum, the external genitalia if present, the external iliac veins are continuations of the femoral veins that are draining the lower limbs. When we look at the lower limbs, we see a pattern that is very similar to what we saw with the upper limbs. The major veins are going to be superficial. The deep veins are vini comitantes of their associatedly named arteries. The superficial veins that we can see include the great saphenous vein. The great saphenous vein um, is significant largely for historical reasons, but let's talk a little bit about its pathway. It is going to drain 
the foot and it has a very important relationship that's very constant with the medial malleolus and you can find it just anterior to the medial malleolus and then it's going to ascend the medial aspect of the lower limb and then it will drain into the femoral vein in the femoral triangle and we'll have associated lymphatics with it. The great saphenous vein is important historically because of its constant location. People would use it as a, uh, as a means to access the vascular system for fast reperfusion. Nowadays, that's, that's not done as often. The great saphenous vein can also sometimes be harvested for coronary artery bypass grafting. The small saphenous vein, also sometimes referred to as the lesser saphenous vein, is going to drain the lateral lower limb. Also draining the foot, this goes up the lateral aspect of the leg, and if we turn to the posterior, so there's the lateral aspect, and then it turns medial, and it dives into the popliteal fossa, where it's going to join with deep vini comitantes to become the popliteal vein which is an accompanying vein of the popliteal artery. Moving to the portal system, as we've discussed in earlier videos, we see that the length of the gastrointestinal tract from the abdominal part of the esophagus through to the rectum, all of those capillary beds drain into larger venous structures. And the three that are easiest to locate and to see include the splenic vein, which usually receives the inferior mesenteric vein, but there's some variation here. There's also a superior mesenteric vein. And the concept to get here is that the union of the splenic vein with the superior mesenteric vein forms the portal vein or the hepatic portal vein. So we have it over here diagraphically. Splenic vein meets superior mesenteric vein to form the portal vein or hepatic portal vein that is then conducted to the liver. And this inferior mesenteric vein typically feeds into the splenic vein. It doesn't necessarily feed into the splenic vein. Sometimes you'll see it feeding into the superior mesenteric vein. But look for this general pattern. The liver, as I've said earlier, is drained into the inferior vena cava through the hepatic veins. Hepatic veins are caval. The portal vein is portal. And that leads us to our assessment question of the video, and that is the venous angle is the union of the subclavian vein with which other vein? Brachiocephalic vein? Well, subclavian does touch brachiocephalic, maybe. External jugular vein? External jugular vein, although not discussed, does feed into the subclavian vein. Inferior vena cava? Mm, no, nowhere close. Internal jugular vein. Ooh, that's a, that's a good one. That, that's ahead in my book at this point. And superior vena cava. Well, nope, the brachiocephalic vein is going to be in the way there. So let's map out these three check marks that we have. So there's the subclavian vein. There is the internal jugular vein. And then there is the brachiocephalic vein going into the superior vena cava. So the angle is IJV with subclavian vein. Therefore, internal jugular vein is the correct answer. And we care about the venous angle because that is where lymph is returned to venous circulation. Thank you very much for your time.